So welcome. Um, my name is Ron Herman, and I'm the chair of the photography department of Foothill College. And I'd like to welcome you to this virtual event. So uh, the first image is Tim. Would you like to unmute yourself and say a few words? Yes. Thank you, uh, Harlan, and then the Ron and Mamen for holding this event. So yes, this image is actually taken in Indonesia. Um, Indonesia is probably roughly an hour flight from um, Singapore. This is the west part of Indonesia, a small island called Belitung. This is where it is actually um, taken. So this is actually on the almost the top floor of a lighthouse that actually oversees the that uh, small islands. Hmm. So yes, uh, so um, you can imagine the view. This is the quote unquote the front view, and also there is a back view. So actually, there is a um, three sixty degree platform that you can walk on to see. Hmm. So at this point, I am actually taking out from a peak from a small window, a rusted window actually that hardly used. Um, to see the beautiful um, image, a beautiful scenery. And then in, um, in line with the title of the, the show, um, we, well, at least I generally have a lot of preconceptions about country, either from the social media or from the news or from the yeah, uh, anything. So being there, seeing things uh, firsthand, experience them firsthand, generally changed my view um, quickly. Mm. I'll show that in my uh, second image. So that's about this image. Um, right, so can you move to the next one, please, Harlan? Yes, so this is the second image. Um, this is also taken at the Belitung Islands. Um, Generally, we, at least I have a pre preconceptions about the fishermen that they actually do their, I mean, for their living, they actually go out um, to do the finding for the, basically for a living, they do a fisherman. And then generally, I originally thought that they usually own their own boats. So apparently that's not the case. So in this case, they are actually renting the boat, if you will. So they have to make their, um, their I guess their, their living by catching the, the, the fish and then paying, uh, selling them and then paying the rent for, for the boats and then whatever the leftover is actually um, their, their quote unquote, their, their living. So again, um, in here is something that I, I guess to learn that even though as a um, fisherman, as uh, doing the fishing, uh, I just realized that not many actually having uh, quote unquote um, simple boats in their in their life for their living that they have to rent to earn some their daily incomes. So that's something that I I, I learned from from this. Uh, experience. So okay. thanks. Thank you. We can go to the next slide. So this artist isn't with us today. I know this one um, was shot in India. I'm in Varanasi, but he's not, um, he's not on the call with us today. So we'll move on to the next one by Mila Bird, who is our Zoom coordinator today. Hi there. Um, so this picture, what inspired me to take this picture was I walked past this boat and I was just fascinated by it. And so when I took the picture, I was more concerned with just trying to get a picture of the boat with a decent composition. Um, but the more I looked at it after I got home and started editing um, is I felt like I captured, there we go. Um, 
Varanasi. I mean, the, along this is along the Ganges River in Varanasi, India, and each of the there's separate areas of the ghats for different things. So there's one where they deal with um, body cremation. There's one that's you know sacred bathing. There's one for laundry. There's one for nightly religious rituals, um, and so in the end. I think I, I tried to, I think I got um, a good understanding of what it's like in a lot of parts in India, which is there's just so much going on at any one given time. And so anyway, that's, that's this. Okay, and then the next image is also by Mila. So this one, um, obviously the Taj Mahal and we were standing on a levee taking pictures of the Taj Mahal at sunset. And I was talking to people in our group and along came this group of young girls herding goats and I did not see them coming because I was in conversation and then all of a sudden there they were. And so I found myself running along the levee trying to get a decent picture of them with the Taj Mahal in the background. Um, so anyway, that's this one. Okay, thank you. And then we're going on to Harlan. So uh, this was taken in, um, in uh, Burma. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, well, this one was taken in Burma in uh, Southeast Asia at uh, Inlay Lake. And this lake has all of this uh, vegetation that grows, tall vegetation that grows uh, in the middle of the lake. And so these fishermen have this technique of standing on one leg, wrapping the other leg around their oar and uh, negotiating their boat through the foliage, standing up so they can see where they're going. And uh, as far as we can tell, this is the only place in the world that uh, has developed this technique. Um, uh, this guy's probably going to need a hip replacement in 30 years, but that's <laughs> his problem. <laughs> okay. okay. And then Malman is next. Okay, so my two images are actually from a project that I work for, uh, the Samburu project. And um, I have been working with them for like eight years. And uh, we go and document some of the water projects. And uh, a lot of people ask me, is this uh, like models or something? This is actually how they dress and how they go. It's, it's going to the well, it's, it's a social thing and it's where you meet your friends and where you, you know, um, have the opportunity to chit chat. And so, you know, it's like when you go to a party, you just get, uh, so they just happen to be there and they happen to have all the wonderful colors and they were laughing with us and, uh, you know, I think this express very much uh, what I do, which is, you know, how you can bring happiness to people when you bring water. So uh, the next photograph, if you want, is uh, so Harlan, uh, we, the next one. we, yeah, Harlan, if you go to the next one, so um, there you go. Um, this is one of the things that I love about traveling. It's you get to know um, the families. You get to know to go to the same wells again and again. Uh, you're invited inside their bomas. Uh, I have seen this kid since he was a baby, and now he's probably uh, taller than you know uh, the the boma maybe. Uh, so you um, actually create connections, real connections with uh, them. Uh, they are part of my group now of women that I admire because they live in such a, um, harsh conditions and yet they are always optimistic and joking and they, as soon as they see you, they start dancing with you and they, it's, it's such a pleasure that I wish I could bring everyone um, to understand that, you know, even though it looks like a, you know, the Boma looks pretty basic. Um, these are really strong people with the strong values and a strong, um, you know, wills to move ahead with their kids. And, and that's one of the things I love about any of these documentary trips, so. So Mama, you bring up an interesting point, which is 
the fact that you've had the privilege to be able to go back to the same location. And yes. through the repetition of these trips, you've built these really deep and meaningful relationships and you just learn so much about the culture. So it's not just yeah. a surface or a trip, um, through repeat visits, you go in deeper and deeper and deeper. And, and I think that reflects, I, I will think that in photography, the, the more you go deeper, uh, it's the more your photograph reflects that. Um, there's so many layers. Like the first time I went to Samburu, I was so fascinated by, you know, I was stuck to how the Boma look or how the people look or, but as you go back, then you go inside the Boma and you are having tea inside there with them and you're seeing the details in the houses and you're seeing, so it's, it's like putting an onion and it's, Really, the deeper you go, the more you find. And, and, and I, I think that's one of the wonderful things about repeating trips. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have to agree. Um, so the next image is by Wes Mitchell. Wes, are you on? I believe he signed up for a ticket, but... Um... Yes, I'm here. Hey, good, good, Wes. How you doing? <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm fine in sunny San Diego. All right, all right. So why don't you fill us in? What's going on with these two images of yours? Um, I guess my sort of general theme, the kind of stuff that underlies all my, uh, all the images that at least that I'm attracted to is that uh, beauty and life flourishing in really harsh conditions. And it doesn't, you know, the, the plains of Northwest Mongolia are pretty harsh. This is this and, and the other of the eagle, the eagle hunter were taken uh, in the Bayan Olgi province of Northwest Mongolia near the border of Russia and China. But the, the funny, the really funny thing is, is that I got to know a few of the people pretty well. Um, I had one image that I submitted that I really disappointed wasn't chosen because it was a photo of, of a young uh, Mongol or actually Kazakh boy and the son of one of my friends from Italy, both about the same age, both about nine or 10, sitting in the bed of a pickup truck. Yes. Playing, playing a video game, which, which I thought, you know, if, if, you're, if you want to talk about the pollination of cultures, here's a good example. So but I, I really, uh, I really enjoyed, I think probably the people most of all, uh, one of the guys I got to know actually turned out to be, uh, had won the, the falconry or, or eagle hunting championship several times. And uh, he was trying to teach me Kazakh, which was hard because he only spoke Kazakh and Russian. And I only knew three words of Russian. <laughs> so what's the lighting in this image? Um, it's a flash. Okay. Uh, this, you know, this is a contrived shot. Um, so we're all in the hut, and the, and the and the young fellow here is posing with his eagle. Okay. Um, and we're exposing for I think maybe five to ten seconds, and there's a flash that goes off in the middle. I see. Okay. The lighting like that. We wanted to do something that was you know, kind of like the sunlight coming through the door, but it wasn't working very well. Right. So this is in one of the, of the yurts. So, um, so I have to tell you, so the image that you were referencing about the two boys in the truck, um, that was an image that mom and I were going back and forth on. Um, we loved it so much for what it communicated. Yeah. And we had a hard time fitting it into a flow with the rest of the images. So that's one of the challenges when you're curating a show is that you find some really great images on their own, but they don't necessarily work sequencing wise with other images. So, sure. so we loved what the image was communicating. So thank you. Yeah, it's, it's too bad. I had, I had another one where the, the, the two of them were running around and playing in, in the herd of cattle and horses. <laughs> mm. Mm -hmm. I, I thought, yeah, and, you know, neither one could understand what the other one was saying, but they got <laughs> along just fine and we're playing really, really cool. Oh, that's awesome. So, thank you.
Yes, let's move on to the next image, which is by Melinda Miller. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Not that one, that one, yeah. <laughs> so again, we were in Myanmar and also in Lay Lake near, nearby. Um, and I think uh, for me, and I know for everyone on that particular trip, we're often kind of, it, it, it's such an unreal place. I mean, there are so many, so many beautiful images, architecture, but also the people are fantastic. But there are so many times that I just had to shake, shake it off that this wasn't a movie set. So this particular situation here was very much like that for me. You can't see, but there was a long, um, I was walking down a long pathway. And before I came to this door, there was an open area where actually the mother of this young girl was on a wood fire boiling um, yarn in, in a big vat of smoking dye. And I have lots of images of that as well. But I was, it was like almost like I was on a dolly moving down a, a, a movie set and I came, I saw her as I was walking. She was walking, her school is in behind there, was behind them. And, and believe it or not, there are three boys also that are just about to come into the image. So I have a whole series of her walking but this particular image, when she stopped, put her hand on the door, she had such a, uh, I could, she had seen me before she wanted to engage, but she wasn't sure. So to me, this is that moment of, of, uh, of kind of uh, reaching across the, <laughs> the divide. And, and I just, I love this, this image. But so what happened after this, so then she did come across, she did come to me. And this is what I find, it's kind of un, it may not be intuitive, but sometimes a camera, you can actually make connections with a camera that you wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable with without a camera, just as a person coming up to a stranger on the street. But with a camera, you have something else to talk about. So she came to me. I had already taken images with her, her mother and so she actually dragged me back to the shed where her mother was dying and dying fabric, uh, dying yarn. She wasn't dying and introduced me to her mother. And then I was able to show the, little, the young, the young girl, the images that I took of her mom. And it, it was just a really amazing experience that I literally would not have had if I didn't have a camera. So that's what I love about traveling and particularly the way Ron and the way we all travel together. Uh, um, so that's that's about this. I mean, I have a lot to say about Myanmar. Uh, we also had, were invited into a home. I love uh, Maman's story uh, and just the way people were so open. They have so little. They're so open. They they were uh, just really beautiful people. And we can't wait to. I can't wait to go back. Uh, the human rights issues are just an obstacle for me right now. But uh, as soon as things become rational again, it's the first place I'll go. So thank you, Ron, for that experience. Well, thank you for sharing that. Okay, so the next image is by Gabby. Um, I'm not sure if she's on, is she on? I'm here. Oh, good, Gabby, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm so glad you could join us. Yeah, of course. Um, I first just, I wanna thank Mammon and Harlan and Ron, you of course, for bringing us to all these beautiful places and Mila for, for helping out as well. So this image is, um, also in India on the, on the, in sort of next to the Ganges in uh, Varanasi. And I just, similar to what Mila said, there are just so many words that can describe Northern Indi India, especially in Varanasi where, where we were. Um, the words that come to mind are crowds, chaos, dichotomies, destitute, beautiful, dirty, joyous, intense, fast. Um, it's really a majestic place and a, just such a rich tapestry of history. Um, and to walk down the streets of Varanasi um, and then along the ghats where this was taken, I first noticed the smells of trash and cow dung and then the lovely nag champa incense. So it's from bad to good. And everything is done in and around the Ganges, the prayer ritual, contemplation, washing, laundry, cremation, festivals, and uh, so many different cultures and practices converging in one. 
And so I just have a strong interest in the way in which people in different cultures do and go about their daily lives and especially laundry. So the way it's done often hanging from rafters or windowsills or uh, in this case, them doing laundry and each person sort of doing their individual thing. Um, I came upon this scene, I believe in the morning of when we were shooting out, just walking around and the reflections in the water and bright color really caught my eye. And I was often, when you're looking in the Ganges, struck by the positioning of each person sort of doing their own thing and going about their own tasks. And so for me, India is really a feast for the eyes and senses. And um, it's just sort of an endless place of imagery because everywhere you turn, there's just something else. So it just was really amazing for me. Thank you. Okay, the next image is by Jackie Rupp. Gabby, that was so much better. Hello. Hi. Hey, Thank you, Ron and Maman. Thanks so much. Um, excited to participate in this. And anyway, on the theme of India, this is, was shot in India. And it was during the Holi Festival in Northern India. And um, I don't know if people are familiar with the Holi Festival, but basically it's a spring festival where kind of the caste system gets set aside and everybody goes out and celebrates and parties and throws powdered paint everywhere. And it's a crazy time for a few weeks. So we were out there and I just, I, I saw this man. And when I photograph, I always look for characters and I immediately connected with him. And I, I probably followed him for half an hour and just kind of waited for things to line up. But I love the colors and that was from the holy dust and just, just the joy in his face. And again, it's just kind of this leveling period there, but I absolutely fell in love with him. So thank you for selecting this. Mm. Love this image. Okay, the next image um, is by Annabelle Port. Um, is she on? Okay, so no Annabelle with us today? Okay. Um, that was also in India. Okay, the next image is by Harlan. Hey, that's me. So, uh, we, I've, I've made uh, three trips down to uh, Cuba with Ron, and uh, this was down in uh, San Fuegos, which is a, a little little town down on the south coast of, uh, close to the south coast of uh, Cuba. And I was hanging out in the, in the main square and sort of saw this commotion going on, and I go over, and here's this guy who, uh, uh, he was either a revolutionary or a revolutionary poser. I, I could never figure out exactly, but he had all these kids around and he was spinning all kinds of tales, I guess. Mm -hmm. And he, just as I, I walked up, he was lifting his shirt up there to proudly show these kids his uh, Shake of Vera tattoo. And so I stuck my camera kind of into the middle of the crowd. And just as I pulled the trigger, he shifted his gaze to me so he was he he was making a connection he wanted me to see that that tattoo and <laughs> um, I, I thought this was just such a such a really cool picture uh, uh the, these kids all trying to uh figure this thing out and, and you know i mean it, 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 this is one of my favorite uh favorite cuba pictures i really enjoy it that's great okay that's one of the next one uh which is by Andrea, I think she's on the phone with us here. Andrea, Andrea you all, are you with us? Andrea. Yes, I'm here. Sorry. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I yes. unmute myself. So, okay. I, so yeah, thank you, Ron and, and Maman and uh, Arlen and um, Mila for putting all this together. Um, so this picture I took almost exactly 10 years ago in uh, Kruger National Park in South Africa. And um, we were traveling with South African friends and we were having, I think, getting ready to have lunch where we would cook our own food in one of the, um, in one of the rest areas. And there was this huge group of people 
and they had so many chickens that they were barbecuing. I've never seen that many <laughs> chickens all together. And then um, we talked to them and it turned out they were all school teachers that um, were kind of celebrating the, the start of the Christmas holidays. So this was the last day of school before Christmas. I think it was December 10th, so it was quite early. And uh, they were all yeah, cooking and eating and having fun and uh, celebrating that they had a break now. So, and I, I just, I, the light was, was beautiful. And I saw these chicken feet sticking out of that bowl and I just, you know, it was quite something. Yes. And the orange and the green too. I like that going on there too. Yeah. But the light really, um, really just illuminates that bowl with those feet coming out. Uh, it's really nice. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Um, the next image is by Pam Perkins. Pam. Pam, if you could unmute yourself. She I think was... I know this by now. There you <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> not my first, it's not my first Zoom. <laughs> uh, this picture was taken in Iran, and as was the other photo that um, was on exhibit. And I'd like to say a little bit about Iran because very few people ever get to go there. And I considered myself so fortunate to be able to go there in 2017. Uh, when, when I told people that I was going to Iran, I mean, they were, they were astounded. Why would you go to Iran? I mean, aren't you afraid? Isn't it dangerous? I mean, what would, what's the purpose of going to Iran? And I wanted to go because of its history and its culture and also it's people. And I wasn't afraid because it wasn't dangerous. And I think as travelers, whether we're photographers or not, we have an obligation to bring back the truth and dispel many preconceived notions that people have. And some of these notions are that Iranians hate Americans and Iran isn't safe and Iranians are radical Muslims, and none of this is true. Um, to the contrary, Iranians love Americans. And if you were to ask me which country uh, that, where I've traveled, and I've, I've been to a few, um, where I met the nicest people, I would say Iran and Ireland. Now, how different could those two places be? And, but when I was there, I also wanted to dispel some of the myths that, that the Iranians have about Americans, even though they love us, they have, they have myths, they have views about who we are, and they think we're all rich. Uh, they think we don't like them. Uh, they think that we aren't family oriented. So I think that I'm through many conversations, I had over that time that I was able to surprise them with answers that dispelled the myths they had about us. And when I came back, I told everyone I knew how fabulous a trip it was. And I also wanted to uh, show through my photography, the kindness of the people. And I think that this picture of this fruit seller in Shiraz is, <clears throat> does that. This man put his hand over his heart, which I now do when I travel, whether it's in Ireland or, or if it's in Africa, it, it sends a message. And what it said to me was, he was so gracious. He, was, he wanted to thank me for my purchase. So um, I felt very fortunate to be able to get this picture and to capture his expression. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. The next image is by Mary Ellen. Mary Ellen Kashub, if you could unmute yourself, please. Here I am. Okay, Mary Ellen. Uh, okay, so, uh, so Harling, can you advance the next? There you go. Uh, you've heard from Mila, and you've heard also from. Um, 
Hello, having a mental moment. Um, Me and Jackie, also from India. Yeah, th those of us that went to India, the Ganges and Varanasi were endlessly, what can I say, stimulating, fascinating. You saw everything there. And also along the way, there were these holy men and they dressed quite differently. Uh, but this particular man was getting a massage, what I thought was fascinating, there on the banks of the Ganges. And the whole setup, he was, they were just in the corner. Um, but the colors, what was going on, was just too good to pass up. It was a great shot. And around the corner from this partition there on the left, there was a full on haircut going on with the barber and some people and whatnot. And it was just so symbolic of the variety and just bizarreness for, for our Western eyes that um, we would occur. But I'm very fond of this shot because it was just had all the elements to it for me about what was going on and how, how very different it was in the middle of a morass of people and color and ages and action and rituals and everything else that's there on the Ganges. All right, thank you, it's beautiful. The next two images are by Jackie Rupp. So Jackie, if you could unmute yourself. I am unmuted. Okay. Okay, so now we've left India. Now we've gone to the Republic of Georgia. So I went there a couple of years ago and was just fascinated because I knew nothing about the country. And it, it's really interesting because, you know, they, um, they uh, were part of the Soviet Union and that all changed in 1991 they, when they gained their independence. And it was just a fascinating country because you really don't hear anything about it. And um, they don't really, they don't see a lot of Americans. So it was really untouched and kind of pure in that way, which I loved. Um, but just, you know, the most, they had, they were, they have a saying there, the guests are a gift from God and the people were so warm. And I think that's true probably of, of all the countries that, that you go to, but it just, it was so true there. And they were just, it was so warm. It was so friendly and, the big thing there were the churches, and I have a couple images from the churches because during Soviet rule, the churches got shut down. They were turned into hospitals. They were, you know, abandoned. They weren't allowed to. to, to um, religion wasn't allowed. So there was a whole quiet period, you know, for 50, 60 years during that time frame. So there was this whole awakening. But this image was I was actually at a nunnery, and I just saw this little girl. And we weren't supposed to have a camera. I didn't have my camera, but I had an iPhone. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I just, we just kept, I know it's from an iPhone. I'm shocked. And we just kept, we just, she and I just kept, you know, our eyes kept locking in. And I just, she, it was a gift. I mean, that was absolutely a gift from God that, and she was just precious. So that's my, that's my iPhone shot from the trip. <laughs> but, so doing something with her hand, I can't really make it out. She just, I think she's just kind of pointing up oh, at the okay. altar there. Yeah. Okay, so, but uh, she was just so angelic. It was, yeah, magical. So that was a gift. And then we go to the next one, Harlan. It's also by Jackie. Yeah. And so that one, I think the other thing that's really important mm -hmm. about Georgia, you know, again, religion's very important, but they're accepting of all religions. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's 85% of the country um, is Orthodox. Christians, and then about 10% is is uh, the Muslim faith. And I don't know if people are familiar with where Georgia is located, but it sits in between, basically in between Turkey and Russia, and then Armenia and Azerbaijan. So you have, you know, a lot of different uh, people coming in from a lot of different countries, a lot of different nationalities that have settled there, and a lot of different religions, but very, very open. And I thought that this image kind of portrayed that. We're in a Christian cathedral. Um, but this Muslim, as this Muslim woman walked through, it just, it kind of, it, it, for me, it encapsulated that and kind of pulled it together. So hmm. that's what this is about. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay, Harlan, we know the next image by Barbara Collins. Uh, Barbara, if you can unmute yourself. 
Um, yes. This is the great Rajasthan trip that we took with Ron. And um, this was taken at the um, Amber Fort or Amber Palace, um, which is just outside Jaipur. And it's another Muslim woman shot. And um, I really liked this architecture because I just, I found this little out of the way place. And it was one of the few places that really wasn't decorated. You could really take in the structure of the architecture and the way that the um, actual volumes of the um, place, they made an impression. And I thought, well, you know, here's this great doorway. Here is this wonderful architecture. Let's have somebody walking by. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping for, and there are a lot of people there that are in Western clothes and that wasn't doing it for me. So after about 20 minutes, she walked by and it was great. And I snapped the shot and I had one chance and there you are. All right. So, yeah. Thank you, thank you. The next image is by Pam Perkins. Okay, well, I've had a lot of people ask me about this picture because they can't quite figure out what it is. Um, this is a picture that I would say I was really lucky to get. Again, it was taken in Shiraz, Iran uh, in 2017. And it's a very famous place. It's called the Nasir al Mulk Mosque. It's also known as the Pink Mosque, and it's one of the most beautiful buildings in Iran. It has this incredible stained glass, uh, thousands of pink colored tiles that cover the walls, <clears throat> and the Persian rugs throughout. And so when I was there, well, first of all, it's a very popular place to photograph for, for a variety of reasons. And when I got there, the place was full of people taking photographs. And I, I couldn't believe my luck because there was this woman uh, standing in front of what appears to be sort of like an altar. And there was no one around. They, they all disappeared. It's the only time I really thought that God was watching me and made it all happen. And I got this picture and I got it in focus, which was even better. And, um, and then she turned around and she was in blue jeans and a tank top. Hmm. And what she was, was she was a model. And oh. she was there modeling for a photographer. I didn't know that. and. So I consider myself really fortunate. Uh, I hope I didn't spoil anybody's uh, view of this by telling you about the jeans and the tank top, but <laughs> uh, I felt I needed to be honest. And it is one of my favorite pictures. And there are some people here that are watching this who actually have this photograph blown up and it's on their wall. So I want to thank you to them. And oh, awesome. thank you to Ron and my man for for having this show. Oh, thank you. Okay, we can go to the next slide. It's by Mary Ellen Kashu. This is in Laos. This is um, Lung Prong in the capital. Every morning, they have an alm celebration and the monks from the different Buddhist facilities there gather and they start with the oldest and it goes all the way down until the little, little tidy guys who might be six or so and they're all in their saffron robes, they're carrying their buckets and they, they collect rice as they walk through the town around along the main street, it has become quite a popular tourist uh, destination. So tour groups will provide these little mats so people can sit on the mats and they'll give them a little bucket of rice, enough to give to everybody that goes by. 
it's actually started to become a problem because there's too many tourists. In fact, I stood there before I went back to this street and one of the guys there was from New York and, and he knew something about something I knew about. We had this very lovely conversation, but it was not quite native. Uh, however, if you go one block in back, this is where the locals uh, actually have a little pot of rice, sit and give out a handful to each person that comes by. Uh, I have a number of photos of, of women doing that and, and whatnot, but it was, it was really, it was very special to see uh, this many um, monks and the different ages, and this is their meal for the day. So what they get uh, then is put together and, and that's how they eat too. Hmm. All right, thank you. Um, next up is Sharon Wada. So Harlan, if you could make, yeah. oh, pardon me. Um, so you're sure that's the next slide, right, Harlan? Okay, so that image is by Marilyn Howard. So we'll get to Sharon in just a moment, I believe. Um, so Marilyn, if hi, you could... hi. <laughs> hi, thank you all for putting this together. Um, this is a picture of the Hill of Crosses. It's located kind of in central uh, Lithuania. I was on a bus tour and our a uh, bus driver suggested to the uh, tour guide that we stop and take a break at this location. So it's um, uh, quite an interesting, there aren't people in it, but it really tells quite a story because I, I think it's a symbol of dis defiance as well as a location for pilgrimage. No one really knows how this got to be a sacred location. Hmm. And um, probably started sometime in the 19th century where people put up crosses and then during different uprisings the crosses were destroyed and um, at one point in time well during the Soviet occupation they destroyed them they burned the, the uh, wooden ones and used the metal and the cement ones to make roads and they destroy it during the day and somehow even though they blocked the roads and at one time, they even flooded the area around it, but crosses would still come back and reappear. So it really demonstrates the tenacity of the people who were there realizing this was a sacred place to them. Now there's well over 100,000 crosses and more each day. I mean, we added one when, when I was there and uh, it's now illegal to, uh, uh, get rid of or, or destroy any of the crosses. So what you see is only a portion of them and it's quite a, it's an amazing place. Well, I have to tell you when we were, you know, sorting through all the submissions and there were quite a few, um, this one really caught my eye because I just wanted to know the story. And so I'm glad that you're here to be able to share it with us. Yeah. It's an amazing story about a place and, and the people. Thank you. Okay, Harlan, can you go to the next slide, please? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to say okay. one thing for a second. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Harlan, can you see if you can, uh, I think because you have the screen, the annotation, that line in the middle, if we could try yes. to. Okay, yeah, because I'll, it's in yeah. all the pictures. <laughs> I'm, going, I'm going to, uh, I think I'm going to have to stop sharing. There's something, something going on. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a slight. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming. It's it's so good to see so many familiar faces and some new ones as well. So it's a good crowd. Perfect. Better. Perfect, thank you. Better. And I've lost Sharon's uh, picture, so I'm gonna have, we have to come back at the end and do that one. Okay. 
Um, so Jackie. So it's me again. <laughs> so we're still, we're back in Georgia. Um, and this was up in the mountains in Georgia. And it was probably up, I don't know, at about four or 5,000 feet, but it was, you know, beautiful country. And so we were up in this small town for a few days. And I, what I loved about this image was it, it captured, you know, um, the priest caps it with the, with the child and then touching the cross, but you also get a sense of, of place with the mountains, you know, in the background. So that's what it's blessings of the cross. So Beautiful. that's what this, thank you. Clouds in the background too, I love that. I love to go black, back and forth between black and white and color. Mm -hmm. uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. So that one is actually by me. This was um, something that I shot when I was on a Fulbright um, doing research in Senegal on religious diversity. And I was studying um, Sufi Muslim brotherhoods. And so these two individuals um, belong to a group called the Bifal. And this is how they greet each other. And um, their whole thing is about, they have a really uh, strong work ethic. In fact, many of them work in the fields um, and they're all about peace, but this is how um, each individual sort of greets each other. And um, so what was, what was interesting about that experience for me was how hard it was to get the access into this group. And um, it took several weeks to kind of sort of gain their trust um, because a camera and the color of my skin wasn't um, just because of the colonial history of what the camera has done to these people. Um, uh, really raised a lot of roadblocks. And so, so after gaining their trust and trying to explain what it was that I was trying to do through photography um, is really how I gained their trust. And once I did, then they let me into their community, let me into their homes um, um, and to meet their families and sit down with a meal with them. Um, and so just the time that it took was an interesting process because um, those things kind of evolve and those things, um, you can't really put like a time on it because each individual person is gonna be different and each uh, experience is gonna be different. So, so that was a real big learning experience for me, I have to say, um, and it, really altered the way that I photographed when I came back because um, it deeply affected me and it, and it took me a while to, to actually get back into my zone uh, photographically. But just that experience, spending time with these people and learning about their culture um, was something that I'll never forget. So let's go on to the next one. Okay, so this is by Sharon Wada. Hi. So uh, this group of people, the Abui, um, they're an indigenous ethnic group in a remote mountain village in Indonesia. The island of Alor is about two thirds of the way to the east um, across this long island chain. And so um, we had an opportunity to visit this village. And these people are performing a harvest dance and um, so it was really interesting to see them go through um, kind of the acting out of the harvest and how they work together. And I think the big thing that I wanted to try to um, capture was the, the idea of unity. And so um, in capturing the dance part, it was less about the dance and more just about the people and the ethnicity of the people and the connection of the people. Um, you'll also notice that they're wearing um, traditional garb um, for the dance and um, a lot of these I think are ikats which they made themselves which are the traditional Indonesian weavings. Um, what they do with the yarn is my understanding of, of how they make the ikat is they take the yarns and they dye the yarn the pattern into the yarn itself 
before they weave it. So there's a, a lot of um, you know precision and care and creativity that goes into making their garments as well. Fantastic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Harling, can you advance to the next one? Okay, this is this is actually uh, by Annabelle Port. Has she come on to the call? And if so, can you unmute yourself? Um, and Harlan, we're missing Sharon's October 31st image from the Day of the Dead. I'm going to give that to you, the next one. Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay. You want that? Yeah, Annabelle's not here, I don't think. Okay, so when you're ready, you can just bring on um, the other one from Sharon Wada. I'd forgotten that I titled this with the October 31st. <laughs> yeah, what a great day. Um, so this is the beginning of our evening in um, at, we were at uh, Hoho Kotlan Cemetery in Oaxaca, Mexico. And it was Dia de los Muertos. So the evening started at this really incredible kind of intimate cemetery. Um, and the challenge with photographing that whole night, which we spent the entire night um, in different cemeteries, uh, with the people who were up all night um, was the lighting, you know, so trying to think about how do we capture only with candle. Um, I, some people maybe use flash. I think a lot of us decided not to because we wanted to capture the mood. So, um, you know, trying to get the right exposure, a lot of long um, one over 15, one over 10 handheld exposures and depending on the situation, this was probably a little brighter um, and um, so anyway, just incredible uh, place to go. I highly recommend trying to go at some point and you need to go for like five or six days and you need to go before because there's parades and celebrations and dancing and music and lots of mezcal and everything. And then the evening comes of the, the Dia de los Muertos that night. Um, and um, you used to go you know, from cemetery to cemetery and it's just uh, a life-changing experience. It was great. All right, thank you. Okay, so then um, we did give out some awards. We gave out a first, a first place award, um, which if you go on to the next slide, um, went to Pam Perkins. And when mom and I were both looking at the images, we both kept coming back to this one. Um, we loved the image that was on the postcard that many of you received or saw. Um, it was the other image that she made that um, the woman that was veiled with her back towards us. Um, but this one really expressed for us the humanity of the people. And I think that this is a country, like Pam said, that People have ideas, um, you know, they have ideas about, and this image sort of countered exactly what was going on in my mind from what I've been fed from the media. So just seeing the expression in his eyes, I'm um, in the gesture, was something that looked so honest and so dear um, that we felt like it really sort of encapsulated what we were trying to do with the show. So that one got first place. And then we gave out three honorable mentions. Um, and I should say, Mom, and if, you, if there's anything else that you wanna add, please feel free to. I'll just keep going unless- um, No, yes. I think that we both agree on, on uh, for me, it was just breaking a barrier with people thinking and listening to, to Pam, it really came across with exactly what you were saying. It's, it's uh, a lot of people have these ideas that they are so, you know, against you, whatever. And this just kept like, it brings the humanity. So it, it's really, we both agree on that one, so. Oh, okay, great, thank you. So we give out three honorable mentions and the first one went to Jackie for this image. Um, the, we had a real difficult time um, with, with Jackie's submissions, I'm gonna be honest, because they were so darn good. There were so many that were so darn good. Um, you know, it, it was just hard um, just to select a few. 
Um, and then uh, we definitely wanted to award her work in some way because it's exceptional, we felt. And this image particularly stood out for us because we, uh, Mom and I have both been to India. I mean, I've been to the Holy Experience and um, I imagine she has as well. And this really encapsulated so much in terms of sense of place, that expression on his face is just priceless. And just seeing, seeing the colored paint um, on his face, on his clothing, on the drum, but just the happiness on that face um, was just a nice moment. So that's why, uh, that's why we selected that one. And then if we can go on to the next image by Mila. Um, so this is an artist that I've been following for you know several years now and seeing her really develop. And um, I was on this trip with her and so I know that experience that she was looking at. And mom has been to India numerous times because she's got family there and she's always there. Um, um, so we both know the place, we both know the setting, we both know the energy, we both know what's going on there. And we felt that this image really did capture that sense of place and really capture the moment or the feeling of, of this location. But also we wanted to honor um, Mila for just the hard work that she's put into her photography because um, I've seen such an improvement over the years. And so we wanted to award her for that. So we can go on to the next one by Sharon. Oh my gosh, Sharon had so many incredible images from this trip. Um, and some incredible moving ones, slow motion moving ones as well that were so interesting, but we could not make it work in the sequencing. Sort of like with the photograph from Wes that he was referring to um, earlier from Mongolia. Um, so we couldn't include that. We loved this image because of the lighting, the framing um, and the mood that was going on with it. Um, so that's, that's what I recall about our conversation, Mom. Would you like to add anything else? No, I think that the, the, all the special mentions and they all brought not just uh, a description of the place, but a feeling of the place. And I think that's what makes a great photograph. Um, you can learn from that image and, and understand more the culture. So I think that's all of them were outstanding and bringing that feeling of their place, so. Okay, fantastic. So um, this was a very, um, very interesting process to be involved with. Um, and I want to thank all the artists for the amazing work that they shared with us and for the trip that, that that they just took us on around the world when we're all quarantined at home. Um, what a lovely way to just sort of escape for an hour and learn about some new cultures um, and new people and just new ways of living. So thank you again for, for sharing that with us. Um, we're gonna transition into the Q&A and I know that Mila has been monitoring the chat. I've seen a couple questions come in. Why don't we take the ones in chat first and then we can open it up to the floor for anyone who wants to unmute themselves um, and they can ask their question live if they'd like to do that. So Mila, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Okay, so the first question uh, goes back to Maman's images. Uh, somebody asked, where were these taken? So these are all taken in Samburu, uh, which is an area in the north uh, part of Kenya. Uh, it's a, uh, sorry, 
Um, so I was going to say, so so Harlan, do you think we should actually put up the image? Yep. So if, so if um, that's easy for you to go back to share and just, and just pull up moments because they're actually both together and they're in the beginning of the show. Just because it might be nice moment for mom uh, for people to see what you're talking about again. Yeah. So, so it's, um, images seven and eight. They are um, they're a distinct group uh, in in Kenya called uh, the Samburu people, and uh, they have a language that is similar to the Maasai, but it's a slightly you know they can communicate with each other, but it's a different language. Um, we could go in the history how these two groups split, and uh, but essentially it's about five north, five hours, six hours north of uh, Nairobi. Um, a very remote area. There is not that many um, places to stay, or uh, there's no water. Um, so it's a very, it's a very beautiful area. I will say that if you go to Kenya, I will highly recommend this. Okay. Then there was another question about the image of the children pumping water. Somebody asked if that was a composite image. Uh, yes. I, it is not a composite image. It's uh, I was asking. I, I was answering to that question. Um, most of these images are taken in the middle of the day, so there is a lot of uh, shadows, and, and uh, it's extremely difficult to photograph. Actually, so you always have to use flash. Uh, so there is a huge uh, uh, dish um, to to compensate for um, you know that difference between um, their skin tone and the light that it's coming from behind. Uh, and that creates a you know, that sense, but it's just the effect of the flash. It's not a composite. All of them were there. Okay. So Harlan, if we could move forward two images, two slides to uh, Wes's image of the yurt. Someone was asking if the people that lives live in these uh, are there year round or whether they're nomadic and move around. Uh, they're nomadic. Uh, they tend to follow the rainfall and the grasses, and in the winter time they have a very arduous trek over the Altai Mountains, uh, which I forget is either north or south of there. I forget my geography, but you can set one of these things up and and uh, take it down and in about a day with enough people. Hmm. I saw them setting one up in a, in a uh, parking lot behind a vacant building in one of the little towns. <laughs> hmm. Okay, and then the last question that I saw that it pretty much applies to all the images, uh, someone asked if all of these images were taken from trips from uh, Ron's uh, great organizing, or did some come from individual travel? Some came from individual travel. And that's all the questions that I saw in the chat. So if okay, anyone so, else has um, questions. Yeah, so if, you, if anyone else has a question that they want to ask the artists while they're here, um, or of Maman and myself, the curators, uh, we're here. Just unmute yourself and ask away. So I, I have a question. Uh, sure. And whenever I go places, this is often a very delicate issue, but sometimes people really open up if you ask the right person the right question. And uh, I wanted to know, like, I forget who it was that had taken those lovely images in Georgia. So that's Jackie Rupp. Did you ever uh, run into or discuss any of the sort of political situations? That's a very troubled area. When, when I was in Mongolia, I was astounded at the sort of just under the surface animosity towards the Chinese. And you know, then I went and read some history and I understood why. Um, but. <laughs> Oh, this is Jackie. Yeah. And I think that's one of the, the wonders of these trips because you can have those discussions. And we we were with a couple locals for a couple of weeks and we really got to dive in. And I think what we found, a lot of it was the Russian influence, the Soviet Union. And 
you know, we learned, we definitely got to learn a couple of things. One is that the country, when it first opened up, there was incredible corruption. Um, and over the years, and I probably in the, the last handful of years, they eliminated guns. Everybody had to turn their guns back in. So they pulled all the guns out of the country. And they also had all the police stations and everything had clear glass windows. And it was all about being just, it was all about, you know, really to attack that corruption. So there was a big discussion around that and safety. And it felt very safe now, but for a long time, it wasn't. Um, so that was a bit, that was, that was a lot. And a lot of it also was about whether or not, you know, they were in a better place without Soviet rule or not. And that was generational. The older generation actually was still more comfortable with being taken care of by the, by the government, where the yeah. younger generation was, a lot of it's TV and whatever, but they were very much embracing, you know, the new world and democracy. But we had some great conversations and they really were very open to talking and wanted to learn about us as well. So, yeah, great question. Yeah, I had, I was working in Ukraine in 2016 for about a month and I was astounded by the number of people that would ask me if I owned a gun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course, they're still pretty fresh from the Russian invasion in 2014. And, you know, mm -hmm. some of my friends wanted to leave the country, emigrate to Israel. Some of them were out at the shooting range practicing with rifles. It's just very, very strange. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I found the same thing true in the Baltic countries where people were fearful because they weren't being taken care of, some of the older people. So they really were not quite ready to embrace the uh, being without the Russian rule. Are there any other questions? I have one on a different tack. <laughs> when I travel, I take thousands of pictures. And um, I'm just wondering how uh, each of you sorts through. Uh, is there a process you go through? Are you spending months doing this? Is there a pile of pictures you no longer, you, you, that you just can't even get to anymore? What is, what is your process for finding these wonderful images? I mean, does it just strike you? Do you, anyway, it's just a, a, it's from someone who has thousands of pictures on my computer. <laughs> it's a good question. So is there anyone that would like to address it? Ron, this is Pam. I'd, I'd be happy to talk about that because uh, I too take thousands of pictures when I travel. What I do is I take a computer or my iPad now, which, allows me to upload my pictures every day. So when I get back to wherever I'm staying, I, I take my uh, computer and upload to, I mean, my uh, camera and upload to my computer. And then I quickly go through, I scan really quickly, but I try to pick out what I would call a photo a day. And it's kind of a project that I've embarked on uh, where I pick a photo a day. And it forces me to focus on what I what I was, took that day, um, and it's also oftentimes when I'm taking the photo, I realize it's going to be my photo of the day. And sometimes I tell people, "You're going to be my photo of the day," and they don't know what the world I'm talking about. But anyway, that's the process. So that by the time you get home, you've sort of winnowed down the thousands to hundreds. And you know, you go through your pictures. I'm still going through pictures from Iran. I'm still going through pictures of Colombia. Um, but I think the one day the project, a photo a day project is a really good way to do it. Hey, this is Harlan. Uh, my, uh, my approach to this is, uh, one thing I like to do is let my, let, let my pictures marinate a little bit. And by that mean, uh, by that, I mean that a lot of times you have expectations about your photographs. And when you look at them, they may or may not meet your expectations. But if you set them aside for a while, if you set them aside for a couple of weeks or maybe even a month, then you go back through them, you've forgotten about all those expectations you had for it. And sometimes you, you discover some real jewels. So that, that's, that's one of the things I do. I, I have to say that uh... 
when we went from film to digital, I went crazy. I had so many pictures because you could take as many as you wanted. And, and then I had the same problem. You just say, uh, and it's just like, uh, how do I go through this? So I think that slowly I learned that it's okay to let pictures go and just think what is what you're trying to, to photograph and why you are. So I'm, I have learned to slow down when I'm taking a photograph uh, and maybe, you know, you will miss some photographs, but, but in general, the more I travel and the more I photograph, the less photographs I bring with me. But I know that those photographs are going to be the ones that I'm going to use as Pam say, those are my photographs. So I, I tend to do a much more selective work as, you know, as I had that accumulation of photographs that I say I could never deal with them. So slow I, down. I, I agree with that. I, I, I'm a recovering engineer. So several years ago, I made a, a, a graph of the total number of pictures that I've taken each year. And guess what? It was a downward slope. <laughs> maybe, maybe I was learning something. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> if I could jump in, uh, I do. I agree with Pam, and I do exactly what Pam says. But um, I carried a, a step further. I used to write a travel diary when I tra when I traveled, and I transitioned about I don't know eight or nine years ago over to a blog. So I take the time each evening to upload my photos and also to write a post um, that describes you know, what happened that day. And then I have that uh, to share with people and after I get home to um, you know, remember the details of, of the trip. Uh, this is Jackie. So I, I probably do a similar process. I definitely when I'm out in the field, I download because I want to see, you know, what I've what I've gotten, but also the quality and you know, I th have things correct. But then it is really interesting when you get some distance from it, you know, a few months later, whatever. I that I think Carlin mentioned that marinating, but it's interesting. And I think some of the better images actually come out later when you're not as emotionally attached to to the work. But, you know, I think editing, is, it's kind of a lifelong process. Yeah. But the jewels do come forward, especially with time. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank goodness we've had this lockdown, so we had time to look at our pictures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are any more questions? All right. Well, thank you all for joining us and thank you for all the amazing artists and for um, Maman and for Harlan and Mila for helping us put this on. Thank you all for coming and I hope you guys um, enjoy the rest of the weekend. Thank you. Thank you.